Hi, everyone. I'd like to add my thanks to you for joining the webinar today. Uh, I'd also like to provide some context for this presentation. The goal of ENGAGE is to increase the capacity of engineering schools to retain undergraduate students by facilitating the implementation of research-based strategies to improve the day-to-day -day educational experience. Our focus is on first and second year students because, as you also probably know, these students are most likely to switch out of engineering. The, stra the ENGAGE strategies are to improve and increase interaction between faculty and students, uh, using everyday examples in engineering to teach technical concepts. And the topic of today's webinar, strategy three, improve spatial visualization skills of students with weaker skills. So we've selected these strategies because they improve student interest and engagement in engineering. And while they work for all students, they have a strong impact on women students in particular. So now I'm delighted to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Cheryl Sorby. Over the past two years, I've had the pleasure of working closely with Cheryl, who serves as the lead expert in spatial skills for ENGAGE and has provided professional development to engineering schools as they work through the process of assessing students and implementing a course structure to improve student spatial skills. Most of the engaged schools have been using a course that Cheryl has developed, and it's been working really well. So I've asked her to share a slide or two about the course with you. And Cheryl also has a personal story, no pressure, Cheryl, um, that catalyzed her passion for research and spatial skills that I hope she will tell. Uh, so Cheryl, the mic is passed to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for um, joining us. Uh, I started engineering school a while ago, and I had a math ACT of about 35 and a, and a verbal ACT of, of 33 or something, and I had no problems whatsoever with the engineering curriculum until I got to my first engineering graphics course. And because I had poorly developed spatial skills, I really struggled in that course. It was the first time in my life that I had ever struggled in an academic course, and so I became very discouraged and almost left engineering as a result. Eventually, I persisted, got through my engineering classes, uh, developed some of my spatial skills along the way, and I started teaching engineering graphics. And I noticed that a number of my students, in particular, it seemed like the young women, were also having troubles with their visualization in, in the engineering graphics course. And due to my previous experience and my teaching interests, I then started um, uh, a research program in helping students develop their spatial skills. Uh, we got a, a grant from the National Science Foundation in 1992 to uh, launch this work, and I've been doing this ever since. A recent report just came out from the National Science Foundation, and the title of the report is called Preparing the Next Generation of Innovators. And in this report, they bring out that innovators typically have strong spatial skills as well as strong verbal and math skills. And they, throughout this report, they express the need to look merely beyond verbal and math skills when identifying STEM talent because spatial skills are so important to success. So as quickly as you can, this is the test we give during um, freshman orientation at Michigan Tech. I want you to look at this and tell me what um, the purpose of the test is you have an object on the top line here. This object has been rotated in space. You need to rotate this in space by the same amount and then choose what it would look like if it underwent the same rotation. And in this case, the answer to this is D. So at Michigan Tech, we test our students during freshman orientation, our engineering students, that is. And approximately 10 to 15 percent of our students fail that Purdue test, the test that you took the uh, question from previously, during orientation. Approximately about 10% of the male students fail the test, but nearly one-third of the female students, and sometimes it's been as high as 
So you can see that um, this is a problem that really impacts women more than it does men. And from studies conducted by the Johnson O'Connor Research Foundation, they tested 64,000 professionals who were out there working in the field, and they found that the engineers here are, are at the left end here, along with the architects right next to them. But the engineers and architects need to have the best or have the best developed spatial skills compared to all these other applications or occupations. And most of the things on the left end here are all within um, the STEM disciplines. The gender differences are robust and consistent. We found this time and again. We at, like I said, at Michigan Tech, we test our engineering students every year during orientation. And you can see we have data going back to 1996. And the, the, the other thing you need to know is that this dot here represents about 100 students, and this dot here represents about 700 students. So this gender gap here between men and women is highly, highly statistically significant. Um, and you can see it goes along pretty much every year we have the same gap in spatial skills between um, men and women. So as I said, we got funding from the National Science Foundation in 1992 to, to develop a course. We got a second grant in 1998 to develop multimedia software and a workbook. We've been offering a spatial skills class at Michigan Tech since 1993 without fail. And from the period of 1993 to 2008, students who failed the Purdue test during orientation were encouraged, encouraged to enroll in the course, but they weren't um, required to. Uh, based on the data that we have, the engineering chairs at Michigan Tech uh, made a change starting in 2009 so that now all students who fail the Purdue test are required to enroll in the spatial skills course. And we define failure as scoring 60% or lower on the Purdue test. The course looks like this. We meet for one, one and a half hour lab session each week. It's a one credit course. We start with a short mini lecture of 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, then they, the students will work through the software module for that day in teams of two, typically, and they complete the workbook pages for the remainder of time. Um, uh, most of the time they do that as a kind of a team effort also, but not always. This is what the um, software looks like. And I'm showing you this because you can see then the types of topics that we offer in the class. We do isometric drawings, orthographic drawings, we do rotations, and combining solids. And so this is pretty much the outline for the course. We do one of these modules each week. If we look at gains on this test, the Purdue test up here, the original course was when Michigan Tech was on quarters. This is from uh, 1993 to 1999. The modified course is when we were on semesters. And um, this data is actually just from 2000 to 2002. We see similar results nearly every year. Um, but you can see that the students started at about a 50% and they ended up in the mid-70s at the end of the spatial skills course. And what I'd like to point out about this is that this, these numbers here, this 70, middle 70% 70 average, this is approximately what the average is for engineering students, um, for all engineering students when we test them during orientation. So we, we basically are taking students who are way behind in their spatial skills and bringing them up so that they're about average with their peers in the engineering courses. And you can see the significance of the gain, um, highly um, statistically significant through every year we get a statist statistically significant gain. We've done several longitudinal studies um, to look at the long-term impact of this course. And the types of things we've looked at are grades and uh, retention rates. For students who failed the Purdue test and then went on to enroll in the spatial skills course, what we have found is that they earn better grades in a variety of courses listed here. Calculus as well as pre-calculus, chemistry, computer science, engineering and graphics, physics, 
and that their overall GPA is higher when compared to students who failed the Purdue test but did not enroll in the course. So you can see um, from this data right here, these are the students who enrolled in the spatial skills course. These are the students who, again, failed the Purdue test but did not enroll in the spatial skills course. These are our students with weak spatial skills. They had a statistically higher grade in all of these courses, except uh, chemistry is not so significant as the others. And they ended up with a higher GPA than the students who had weak spatial skills and didn't go through the, uh, the intervention. We also looked at the students who failed the Purdue test and enrolled in the course and compared them to, the, again, the students who pa failed the Purdue test and did not enroll in the course, but also those who passed the Purdue test with a score between 60 to 70 percent. So they, they kind of got it. They were a D student in spatial skills, but they did pass with, um, with our cutoff. And you can see, again, these students who had the spatial skills training had significantly higher uh, grade point average or average grades than the students who passed the Purdue test with a marginal score between 60 and 70 percent and they're again much higher than the students who failed the Purdue test and did not enroll in the course. If we look just at the computer science you can see that the students who took the spatial skills course who needed it had an average grade of just above a B in the course and the students who passed with a marginal score had about a C plus and the students who failed got um, a solid C in the course. And you see the same kind of trend in their overall GPAs. So um, some of you might be out there saying, yeah, but there's self-selection bias in that because prior to 2009, the students who enrolled in the course chose to do so. Um, so I have some very preliminary results, and the, and the reason I say they're very preliminary is that we've only looked at a few grades and a few courses. We are going to be continuing this and hope to publish on this um, in the coming months. But let's look at the data when we don't have the self-selection bias. Again, the students who failed the Purdue test and underwent the spatial skills training did better in one of their engineering courses as well as in their calculus course than the students who marginally pass the Purdue test with a score of 60 to 70 percent. As I said earlier, we also looked at retention rates in our longitudinal studies. And the, again, these are some of the general findings that we obtained. So students who failed the Purdue test and enrolled in the spatial skills course were retained both at the university and within engineering at higher rates than those who failed and did not enroll in the course and those who passed with a marginal score of 60 to 70 percent. And these results are particularly true for women. So let's look at some of this data. Here we have um, students who started at Michigan Tech between 1996 and 98. So all of these have either graduated or left by this point in time. And this uh, teal colored bar here represents the, the um, retention rate or the graduation rate, really, for students who passed the Purdue test with a score of 70% or higher. And you can see that they were retained at the university at about an 80% level, and they were retained in engineering at about a 70% level. These this blue bar here is the bar for the people who failed the Purdue test and went on and took the course. And the, the next, the aqua one, is they passed the Purdue test with a marginal score. And the black one is they failed the Purdue test but did not take um, the spatial skills course. And for each one of these graphs, the difference between this, this group and this group is not statistically significant. But the difference between this group and this group and this group and this group is highly statistically significant. And what's interesting to point out here is that for the students who took the course, they stayed in engineering at about 65% compared to about 40% for the students who failed and did not take the spatial skills course. If we look at some of the results we've obtained by gender, again, these are for uh, 2000 to 2002 and 1993 to 1998. 
Uh, the students who failed the Purdue test and took the course, these are their retention rates within, um, at the university. And um, for the people who passed with a score of 60% or higher, these are their retention rates. These are not statistically significant differences. However, this, for the women who failed the Purdue test and did not take the course, uh, we do see a statistically significant difference between these students and these students. For the men, we see similar trends. However, none of these are statistically significant. However, they are encouraging that we are also, um, we also appear to be retaining more men through this spatial skills intervention. So in conclusion, well-developed math and verbal skills are readily recognized as being necessary to success in engineering. Um, according to this recent publication by the NSB, perhaps we should also add spatial skills to this list. We, at the university, or at my university anyway, we do not encourage students not ready for calculus to enroll in calculus for their first semester. Shouldn't spatial skills training be available for those who need the help? And at Michigan Tech, we believe that we have helped students be more successful in engineering by offering them an opportunity to develop their spatial skills. So based on all, this result, all these results, what can you do or what should you do? One of the things that you should think about doing is assessing the spatial skill level of your incoming engineering students. And through this assessment, you will identify those who have weak skills and target your efforts just at those students. What would I recommend that you don't do? I wouldn't provide spatial skills training to all of your students. Those who don't need it may be bored, and those who do need it may become even more discouraged. Um, if they're in the class and they see that something is super easy for somebody else in the class, they might start to have uh, feelings of self-doubt, and their, what's called their self-efficacy will be diminished. Self-efficacy being just your internal belief that, yes, I can do something. And I would not offer voluntary spatial skills help sessions because it has been shown time and again throughout educational research, not just me, but people in math and in chemistry and other places, that voluntary supplemental instruction never works. You only get a few people who attend regularly. And um, if you're going to do something, I, I would say you would want to do it in the most effective way. Formats that you might consider for helping students develop spatial skills. Offer a course like we do at Michigan Tech. A course for credit, though. Um, you could have required supplemental instruction sessions or required tutoring sessions, similar to requiring tutors, tutoring sessions for students with weak max, math skills, if your university allows you to do that. Not all of them do. You could provide spatial skills training as part of a summer course or a summer bridge program. Uh, or you, one other thing is you could integrate spatial skills training into a required course, but I would only use that approach if most of your students have weak spatial skills and not only if a small percentage um, have the poor spatial skills. Because again, you don't want the students who have the weak spatial skills, which at Michigan Tech is about 10% of the student body, to feel even more discouraged by watching people um, have fun and doing things that um, is very easy to them. And here's my final reflection before we um, pause for some questions. Uh, and I hear this all the time, engineering faculty don't want to add one additional credit to an already full curriculum. So I'm leaving you with a question, which is better, um, asking students to take one extra credit that improves their chances of success in engineering by a significant margin, or is it better to ignore the problem and hope your students survive to graduation? And in the long run, which one is really more costly? If the, if the students leave your university and they're not spending those tuition dollars, um, that is a true cost to the university. Further, it's a cost to the individual because now um, they might be uh, studying, they might never finish college or they might be studying something um, that um, they're not as interested in. So I'm open for questions. This is Susan Metz again. Cheryl, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, it's generated a number of questions, and I'm writing madly here trying to group them together so that we can answer as many uh, questions as we can. And so one of the areas has to do with uh, games. 
we have a couple of questions. Does experience playing spatially rich video games as children improve spatial skills? And have you or anyone thought about developing a game to enhance spatial skills at the secondary level um, by creating more rich gaming, educational games? Yeah, so um, when I first started doing this research in 1993, we found no um, significant correlation between playing computer games and spatial skills developments. Um, but now we are seeing that, and there are a number of people who have um, done actual research studies. Some cognitive psychologists have done research studies and shown that playing certain types of what they call action games will help you improve your spatial skills. I think in 1993 that the games were not very um, spatially rich, and so th that's why we weren't seeing any correlation back then. Um, I have been talking to some, some folks about developing a spatial skills game. This is all in the very early stages of discussion. I know there is interest in it. Uh, so yes, computer games, 3D computer games that are active will help you develop your spatial skills. And um, my thing is this, is that I doubt if parents would approve of their um, children coming home from middle school or high school saying, yeah, we played Tetris for an hour today because my teacher said it would help improve my spatial skills, whereas like we use a software and a workbook um, and that that is much more palatable, I think, to most uh, parents in, in how you develop spatial skills. Uh, since you brought up the uh, workbook, one of our participants wants to know where the workbook and multimedia software is available and um, can you identify specific content in that that's really important when someone's trying to create a spatial skills course? Okay, so the, the workbook is available through, and the software comes in the workbook. It's available through Cengage Learning. Um, and we are in the process, and it's, I'm hope, hoping it will be finished soon. Uh, developing an online version of this that will be available to high schools and middle schools as well as um, for sale just as a workbook for the college um, age student. Um, the types of activities we have found to be extremely helpful have all um, been uh, things like sketching. Um, so what we do is we have in, in the exercises we do we have the students build an object using um, blocks and we have them then sketch it. What would it look like from this point of view? What does it look like from this point of view? And so on. And then we have the students take an object and the, the, they're holding it in their hand as well as seeing it as on the paper and they rotate it in space and then they have to sketch it. What does it look like after it's been rotated? So the sketching is really important and this is backed up by a number of research studies conducted by myself and by others that uh, really the sketching is an important part of helping develop your spatial skills. There's something about the eye-to-hand coordination between seeing something and sketching it on a piece of paper that helps you develop your spatial skills. So those are the types of activities that I would um, encourage you to incorporate in your teaching. Cheryl, two questions related to pre-college work. Uh, one of our participants is using some of your materials at the elementary school level and wants to know if others are doing it. And also, is a high school curriculum available for spatial skills, or can you use the one that you've developed for that group? Okay, so uh, in 2004, I, I got a grant from the National Science Foundation, and um, the purpose of that grant was to demonstrate that the materials that we have, the workbook and the software, is suitable for use with um, middle school students, high school students, and other non-engineering majors, because a lot of times I would talk to um, teachers and they'd be interested in using the materials, and they would say things to me like, um, well, but you developed this for for freshman engineering students, it's not going to work for my students. Um, and so we demonstrated that the materials work very well with the younger audiences. I'm glad to hear somebody's doing something at the elementary school. Please send me an email with your results. I'd love to hear about it. Um, and uh, we just now, 
um, are in the process. Our grant has been recommended. I don't think it's been awarded yet, but we are getting, uh, it looks like we are getting another award from the National Science Foundation. And with this one, we're going to use the materials with um, middle school students and um, track the courses that they take in high school, track their engineering self-efficacy, and track their motiv motivation for STEM um, courses through their high school experiences. So we are kind of excited to be working um, with the middle school students. Uh, what I've said many times is that I hope that eventually the need for my spatial skills course goes away because I think it would be a much better um, world if the students all came to the university with well-developed spatial skills, if they learned this in their middle school, high school, or even elementary school, I think that would be far better than, um, than what is going on right now. And I think what I'm hearing you also say is if students uh, enhance their spatial skills at the pre-college level, they may be more interested, or at least that's what you may be looking at in your next effort, they may be more interested in engineering at the college level because they feel um, more confident in their ability to succeed. Well, it, it, you know, if you look at the data we that I just showed, where spatial skills appear to be uh, critical to success for chemistry and math and, and physics and computer science, so you can understand that if somebody has poorly developed spatial skills, they're less likely to choose engineering than somebody who has well-developed spatial skills. And in fact, in the the pilot study that we did with the 2004 grant, we did find that, that the students who had had the spatial skills training appeared to select higher le or more math and science courses in the high school compared to students who didn't have the spatial skills training, but the sample size was very small and that's part of the reason um, we're really excited about this new grant that's been recommended for funding. Cheryl, uh, why does Michigan Tech use the Purdue test as opposed to other spatial skills tests? to assess their students? Well, when we started um, back in 1993, I was working with a colleague from the math department, and I really was a novice. I didn't really know anything about spatial skills. I knew about engineering graphics and a little bit about helping students learn to visualize, but she was really the expert in um, spatial cognition, and she wanted a test that on mental rotations. She was aware of this test. I think she knew the developer of it, Roland Gay, Gay, I think is how you pronounce his last name. And so um, that's what we started using back a long time ago, and so that's why we continue to use it to this day. And now we'll move to the college level. Uh, one of the questions is, what is your thought on requiring the course for pass-fail and not for credit for students that failed the Purdue test? I guess the question would be, um, at your institution, when people take things for pass-fail, do they take it seriously? So the rule of thumb is always that if it appears on your transcript, um, then students will care about it. And so if, if having a pass-fail course that you fail doesn't look good on your transcript, or if that's the culture at your place, then that could work. Um, in general, I would say, uh, you know, when I have, as a faculty member, when I used to have students try to take uh, my, my other courses, not this spatial skills course, but my other courses pass-fail. In general, they would quit halfway through and they would never finish the course and that was okay because it didn't appear on their transcript. And so again, um, those are the kinds of things you have to, you don't want to waste your effort. So you don't want to have a course that nobody comes to and um, nobody finishes. So. That, that's my caution in having a pass-fail course. But again, it would end on, it would depend somewhat on your institutional culture. Uh, this is an interesting one. What is the average makeup of the course at Michigan Tech as far as women versus men? And if it is mainly uh, women, does this make them feel discouraged from engineering in general? Well, I think the the um, the students have voted with their feet, right? So I, I think that having the women in there showed we had, you know, remarkable increases in retention. So I don't think it discourages them from engineering at, in the least. I think, in fact, it has the opposite effect. Uh, the class is typically about half and half. Um, uh, maybe a, a few more. You know, at Michigan Tech, 
like most engineering schools, we have like 16, 17, 18 percent women. Um, but if you take one third of those versus 10 percent of the men, we end up with a mix of about 50, 50, maybe 60, 40 favoring, uh, or 60, 40 with the 60 percent being the male students. In the past, I know I have had many classes that are 50, 50, and sometimes students will comment on it. They, they don't. I don't ever in my class talk about gender differences in spatial skills. I, you know, that's going on in the background. They don't need to know that. But I have had students walk in, like some male students walk in and say, "Wow, look at all the girls in this class." Um, but I, we don't, we don't ever talk about any of the gender findings in the class at all. So this person has actually offered a class, a spatial skills class, to students who did not do well on the Purdue uh, test, but they got a very low percentage of students who enrolled. Any suggestions for increasing that enrollment for students who should be there? <laughs> uh, well, well, when when we first started out, we had a we didn't have very many students enrolling either. You know, the first. Um, in 19, the first year was part of the grant, and the, the second year was, we were on our own. I think we only had 18 students uh, enroll out of about 125 who failed the Purdue test. And so uh, what we've done over the years is um, have a much more active approach to recruiting students. So um, instead of just passively saying, hey, you know, you failed the test, what, you should consider taking this course, we actually went to them, we showed them some of the data, we showed them how this could improve their grades, and we, you know, kind of, it wasn't strong arming, but we highly, we strongly encouraged them to have, um, to enroll. We also worked in the early days somewhat with some of the academic advisors where we would go to them and we would say, you know, look, we think that you should um, encourage your student to do this. The problem in the early days for us, too, is that we didn't have any data. So we didn't have the data that shows it helps students be retained and it helps them get better grades. I mean, I think what you could do is use some of the data that we've compiled here at Michigan Tech and you make a convincing case for students or you know, contact parents because parents are always concerned about their or about their child's success, and so ta uh, send something to them to get the parents on board, encouraging. I know there's one university um, in the Engage project right now that um, had an interesting approach to this, and I wish I would have thought of it 20 years ago. But um, what they did is they took all the students who failed the Purdue test and automatically enrolled them in their spatial skills course and then let them drop if they wanted to. Um, and that way they had um, a, a remarkable increase in participation among the students enrolling in the course. So one of our participants wants to know if uh, students could do the workbook and uh, software as a self-study project on their own. And where do they find the spatial test to assess students? Okay, well the spatial test is in the teacher resource guide that goes along with the workbook. I believe also that the folks at Purdue have put it online and I think that you can get access to the online version of the Purdue test. Um, I know Susan has the Susan Metz has the information on that. Uh, yes, I think a student can work through the workbook as a self uh, self paced study. Excuse me. Um, they, you know, I I have had undergraduates teach this course. I have grad I've had graduate students students teach this course. Um, it's it's. I keep telling people it's not rocket science. It's actually pretty simple when you get right down to it. Uh, and I think that a, a motivated student could complete this as a, as a um, self-study, yes. And one of our participants actually teaches a women in engineering seminar and has many topics to cover. And she wants to know, uh, what is the minimum amount of time you can spend on the spatial skills curricula and still get the results that you're looking at? How many hours uh, do you need to set aside for this? Okay, so I don't know the answer to how many, what's the min number of result, uh, hours to get the results I've gotten because I've never tried to minimize the number of hours. However, I did work with a high school um, geometry teacher um, in my previous study that was funded in 2004, 
and that teacher uh, only covered four of the nine modules. She covered the isometric drawing, the orthographic drawing, and the two on rotations. And she did get very significant increases in spatial skills. Um, but again, I don't know if um, what, what the long-term impact of all that is. I'm not going to speculate on that. That would be unscientific of me. But I do know that she did get um, nearly the same gains on some spatial skill assessment just by doing those four modules. Okay, the clock is telling me to uh, wrap up. We have a few more things we wanted to point out in terms of people who want to implement this. Uh, so any of the questions we didn't get to will be answered uh, offline. Cheryl, thanks so much again for uh, presenta your presentation and the responses to these questions. There's a lot of interest out there, which is really exciting. Thank you, Susan. Engage has a website. This is actually a snapshot of the spatial skills page on the Engage website. You get to it by going to the home page and just clicking on strategies. We have a number of resources available for schools who are working to assess students' skills and then provide the training course. And these folks have really found some of these resources very useful. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about Engage or the materials, here's the contact information.